This photo, taken from a traffic camera in Russia in 2013, might look like any other ordinary surveillance image, but it's far more disturbing than you realize. The driver is 40-year-old Victoria Nasrova, an escort who is fleeing Russia for U.S. soil. Just visible in the passenger seat next to her is the ghoulish image of a woman slumped back, mouth open. This is the body of the woman Victoria just murdered for money. The image will go on to spark an international manhunt and help solve not just this case, but a two-year spate of terrifying attacks in Brooklyn, New York. She's a narcissistic homicidal maniac. This defendant intended to kill this woman and steal her identity. You are an extremely dangerous woman. <laughs> Before we begin, we would like to send our deepest sympathies to the victims of Victoria Nasrova, including Olga Svig, Ruben Bukharov, and Nadia Ford. It's September 2, 2016. 37-year-old Olga Svig, a Queens-based beautician, had just woken up in a New York hospital, feeling groggy and with almost no memory of the previous week. Hospital staff explained to her that a neighbor found her unconscious on the bed surrounded by pills. At the time she was brought in, she was just 40 minutes from death. She had been in and out of the hospital twice, comatose, and at one point almost having a heart attack. But all her blood tests have come back normal, and doctors can find no explanation for the mysterious illness. When I came to the room, uh, I saw my sister very sick. Uh, she was like a vegetable. Uh, and uh, I tried to understand what happened with her. Uh, ask about uh, where is money, jewelry, documents. Uh, I uh, checked all and uh, called to emergency again because she was very bad. Olga is stunned. The last thing she remembers was that a Russian client of hers, a woman named Victoria Nasrova, had begged her for an emergency eyelash repair as she was going on vacation the next day. It was Olga's day off, but she had insisted on coming to her home for the appointment. Victoria was hard to say no to. Brazen and glamorous in mink coats and diamonds, Victoria had been trying to befriend Olga for months. But something about the woman unsettled Olga. Not least that 40-year-old Victoria and the Ukrainian-born Olga looked uncannily alike. She'd given in to Victoria's demands, and when she arrived, Victoria passed her a token of thanks, three slices of cheesecake from a famous New York bakery. Within minutes of eating the cake, though, she became ill, dizzy, and unable to focus. Her last memory was of watching Victoria walking around the room. She didn't know it then, but Olga had just fallen prey to a ruthless and calculating predator. When I eat that cake... I feel right away very, very sick. I, like, lose my vision. Still feeling groggy and sedated, Olga is discharged from the hospital and returns to her apartment with her sister, who had flown in from the Ukraine. Once there, she realizes that her apartment has been looted. Jewelry, handbags, her ID, and passport were all gone. The shocking truth hits home. She had been drugged, robbed, and left for dead. But there are more shocks to come. The neighbor who found her tells her that he saw a woman coming and going from her apartment during the time when she had first fallen ill. On one occasion, he had run into her taking Olga some chicken soup. She had told him that Olga was sick. By the end of that day, when he heard no movement from Olga's apartment, he had used a spare key to check on her, only to walk in on a very bizarre scene. Her bedroom was like a furnace, Despite the summer temperatures, someone had turned the heat on high. Olga was laying in the bed in lingerie with pills scattered around the floor. Olga remembers she was wearing sweatpants when she saw Victoria. Horrified, she realizes that Victoria changed her clothes before staging the room to make it look like she had overdosed. Olga's sister contacts police, and NYPD detective Kevin Rogers interviews Olga at her apartment. 
As Olga describes the ordeal, he notices that she is visibly sedated and wondered if she was a drug user. He wants to believe her, but he finds her story to be almost too outlandish to be true. Still, Rogers recovers the containers from the trash that hold the remnants of the cheesecake and bags them for evidence to be sent off to forensics. Several days later, the results are back. The cake was negative for any trace of known drugs. He has also tried to find Victoria, but to no avail. The investigation stalls. For Olga, though, the nightmare was just beginning. She is terrified that Victoria will return to finish the job. And she can't help but wonder, who else has been a victim of this woman? In June of 2016, a business owner in Queens named Ruben Bukharov is scrolling through a Russian dating app when he comes across a beautiful woman who says that she loves to cook. Her name? Victoria Nasrova. The two match, and Victoria turns up at Ruben's apartment to cook him a meal. She serves him a piece of fish. Within minutes of eating it, Ruben feels woozy and then passes out. When he wakes up, he's in the hospital, where he is told he has been unconscious for almost a week. Ruben has no recollection of getting to the hospital. The employees at his dry-cleaning business tell him that a woman brought him to the shop two days after she had met him in his apartment. She told them that he had drunk two bottles of wine and possibly taken some pills. Ruben's sister calls an ambulance, and one of the employees videos the scene, briefly catching a shot of Victoria sitting in Ruben's office chair. She was walking here and there and making some stories to my workers. Oh, we had wine. He drank two bottles of wine. I don't remember nothing. As Victoria talks to the workers, Maybe take pill or something, right? the camera catches a glimpse of her sitting in the boss's chair. Before the ambulance arrives, the woman has gone. On her way out, she takes $200 in cash from a drawer and a watch. Realizing that he had been drugged and robbed, Reuben checks his bank accounts. While he was unconscious, the woman went on a shopping spree with his American Express, spending nearly $3,000. Reuben contacts the police, but they are unable to find the woman. And then, a strange twist. One of Reuben's employees is getting her lashes done when the beautician, a woman named Olga, confides in her of a horrible experience where she was drugged and robbed. Just like in Reuben's case, doctors could find nothing suspicious in his system and the cake she ate had come back negative for drugs. Both are victims of Victoria Nasrova. What neither of them know is that Victoria is an internationally wanted woman, not just for robbery, but murder. In early 2014, 54-year-old Ala Alasienko is living in a town of Krasnodar in Russia, near the Black Sea, when a new friendly neighbor moves into the apartment next door, a masseuse with a young son who lives with his grandparents named Victoria. Beautiful and charming, Ala is flattered when she finds Victoria taking an interest in befriending her. Ala's only daughter, Nadia, is living in Queens, New York, and she finds the younger woman's company refreshing. She's also a wonderfully attentive listener. Before Ala knows it, she is telling Victoria all kinds of things, including secrets that she's only ever told her daughter. Ala's daughter, Nadia, is less than enthusiastic about her mother's new best friend. She can't help but wonder what a woman like Victoria would possibly have in common with her mother when she learns that Victoria dislikes her mother's friends and is discouraging her from seeing them, her suspicions deepen. Is Victoria trying to isolate Ala and make her dependent on only her? In the fall of 2014, her mother tells her that Victoria is planning a trip to New York and that she has been given gifts that she wants delivered to Nadia. They include $6,000 cash and two mink coats, but the dates for Victoria's trip come and go, and Victoria has still not left Russia. On October the 4th, Nadia convinces Ala to ask Victoria to return the gifts and phones her that next morning to find out how it went. Nadia's mother doesn't answer her phone. With a growing sense of dread, Nadia phones again and again and again. 
because for eight years she never happened that she didn't answer the phone. Never. Desperate, she goes online and logs onto her mother's cell phone records. The last person her mother spoke to was Victoria. It was at 11 p.m. on October the 4th, a day before her mother had stopped answering the phone. Nadia places a call to Victoria, who tells her that Allah has gone on a trip. She then receives a strange message purporting to be from her missing mother. It says, Sweetie, don't worry about me. I'll notify you where I am soon enough. And that's it. And then my heart dropped. I just started to have this feeling that something happened. Nadia books the next flight to Russia. She gets on a plane within a day and heads to Russia. She just was a dogged investigator. She just didn't stop at anything. I went all over Russia. I drove over 60,000 miles. I spent thousands and thousands of dollars. I was looking for my mom everywhere. Once at her mother's apartment, she discovers that the apartment has been emptied. Family heirlooms, expensive jewelry are all gone, including her mother's life savings, the equivalent of 40,000 U.S. dollars, which she kept hidden in a space under the floor. Only her and Nadia knew about that money. She calls the police, who question Victoria and administer a lie detector test. They allow Victoria to leave the precinct while they wait for the results. It's not Victoria's first brush with the law. She has worked for years as an escort and a self-styled dominatrix and has multiple charges of shoplifting and other petty crimes. Police, meanwhile, tell Nadia to wait it out and that her mother will be back. Nadia has no intention of waiting it out. Over the next six months, she dedicates her life to finding her missing mother. She drives across the country posting flyers and contacts every friend and acquaintance of her mother and every hospital and police station. Finally, Nadia catches a break. Realizing that every main road leading from her mother's apartment has traffic cameras, she gets hold of the footage and begins trawling through image after image from the night that her mother went missing. Hundreds of hours later, it pays off. She finds an image of a car with a woman she believes is Victoria behind the steering wheel. Next to her, a middle-aged woman is slumped in the passenger seat, mouth open. Nadia is positive that that woman is her mother. The photo was taken about 10 a.m. on October the 5th, the day her mother stopped answering her phone. She contacts local authorities and is shocked when they tell her they've already seen the image. They confirm that Victoria rented a car with those plates shortly after they had brought her in for a lie detector test. Victoria had fled Russia, first leaving town in that very car. She had managed to evade authorities with the help of a police officer whom she bribed with sexual favors. Then, in April of 2015, Nadia receives a devastating call. A charred body has been found in a remote area some two hours from Allah's apartment. It's not her, no. It's, it's uh, just remains. And then a few minutes later, I started looking at her teeth. Dental records confirm that the remains are Nadia's mother. Ala Alasienko. An international arrest warrant was issued for Victoria Nasrova. Meanwhile, Nadia returns to New York. On an impulse, she searches for Victoria on Facebook and finds her. In the days and months since killing Ala, she had been living it up, first in Mexico and then, to Nadia's shock, in Brooklyn, New York, her very own neighborhood. With the police apparently unable to find her, Nadia turns to a private investigator, Herman Weisberg. Herman agrees to take on the case, and the more he learns about Victoria, the more he realizes just how cunning, ruthless, and dangerous she is. Since arriving in the U.S., Victoria had been advertising her services as a private masseuse, escort, and dominatrix. I did partake in those dating sites where the man is a slave and the woman is a dominatrix. Okay, so you, you, did, you, you were a dominatrix? Yes. And did you go by the name of Rachel and Mara? Um, a different name. Okay. No my name, no Victoria. Rachel, Mira, Sabina, different name. 
He learns that not only is she wanted by Interpol, but by the NYPD as well, on suspicion of drugging and robbing at least three men she met via a New York dating website, and two women. She seems to seek out rich clients, uses drugs to render them unconscious, takes their property and money, and then leaves them for dead. Weisberg believes Victoria has plenty more victims in the area, but many are reluctant to come forward. But how to find her? Here is where Weisberg employs some amazing detective work. This particular picture was the most beneficial. She's wearing the Ray-Ban sunglasses again that are mirrored, and she took a great picture for us to, uh, to see the dashboard of the car. You can see that unique configuration, but more importantly, the stitching on that back it's headrest, right yeah, that's this black leather with a white or light gray stitching on it. It made the car that much more unique to me. Weisberg spends night after night scrutinizing the images on Victoria's Facebook. Many of the likes of her photos are clustered around an area in Brooklyn called Sheepshead Bay, which is a popular enclave for Russian immigrants. Then one image in particular catches his eye. In it, Victoria is wearing mirrored Ray-Ban sunglasses, and reflected in those glasses is the dashboard of a car and black leather seats with light gray stitching. Both are unique. The next day, he trawls a parking lot, peering into the windows of cars. Finally, he finds what he's looking for. A Chrysler 300 is the only make and model of car with that dashboard and the unique stitching. Assuming from her Facebook likes that she is in the Sheepshead Bay area, his team focuses on scoping the neighborhood for Chrysler 300s, running each number plate through a database. One comes back with a Russian-sounding name. It's parked outside an apartment building that looks familiar to Weisberg, who realizes he's seen the windows and doors in another image caught in Victoria's reflective glasses. Weisberg's surveillance team stations themselves outside the apartment, waiting for a sighting of Victoria Nasrova. At last, she emerges, along with the man who owns the Chrysler. Weisberg alerts the Brooklyn Division of the NYPD, and on March the 20th of 2017, she was arrested on an open warrant and taken into custody. During a later search of his residence, Victoria's boyfriend will realize that she has stolen from him as well, and that she likely poisoned his beloved dog, Joey. I'm very jealous of uh, the, the dog getting some of the spotlight in their house and uh, decided to poison the beagle, allegedly, on the beagle's birthday. I'm a dog lover, so that stuff. While Weisberg is doing his detective work, Detective Rogers from the Queens Division of the NYPD has picked up the case again. He heard Olga's neighbor's account of seeing a woman coming and going from Olga's apartment and realized that Olga was telling the truth. He issued her an apology, but was still unable to locate the elusive Victoria. I do have to make that sort of uncomfortable apology to her. Of, I'm truly sorry for not believing you 100% at first. Rogers is shocked when he gets a call from Brooklyn police that they have just brought Victoria Nasarova into custody. Evidence taken from Victoria's boyfriend's apartment included various items belonging to Olga, such as her work permit. Victoria, they discover, is carrying Olga's passport. Her U.S. visa is due to expire. Rogers once again notes the striking resemblance between the two women. Like Olga, he now believes that Victoria was trying to kill Olga that day and steal her identity. Now, he just needs to prove it. Rogers sends the cheesecake evidence to a different laboratory for extensive testing. This time, they get the results that he was hoping for. The cheesecake comes back positive for phenazopam, an incredibly potent tranquilizer that is banned in the U.S. but is commonly used in Russia. The crime lab also finds DNA on the cheesecake container. It is a match for Victoria Nasrova. Rogers believes that when Olga didn't die from the first dose of infused cheesecake, Victoria tried again with chicken soup. Rogers now has everything he needs to charge Victoria Nasrova with premeditated attempted murder. Due to legal delays and the COVID pandemic, Victoria spends six years in custody before finally standing trial on June the 30th of 2023. 
She pleads not guilty to charges of attempted murder, theft, unlawful imprisonment, and assault. She immediately gets sick. She starts to vomit. She was hallucinating because she came to realize that many of her valuables were gone from her room. Almost $4,000 in cash and her U.S. issued employment authorization card. The DA says Nasarova chose a victim who resembled her at the time, both with dark hair, the same skin complexion, and speak Russian. When police arrested Nasarova, she even had Svik's passport on her. Olga Svik survived her attack by Victoria, and on February 15th of 2023, she is in the court to give her victim impact statement. I would go to work and I would shake. My whole body would shake. Then I would come back home, I would look over my shoulder because I was afraid. I was worried that you would see her again. Ruben Burukov also testifies that she fixed him dinner before he passed out and realized he had been robbed. On the third day of the trial, Nadia takes the stand. The judge has prevented prosecutors from going into specifics about the murder charge in Russia, but Nadia is still able to tell the jury something terrible had happened that resulted in her mother's disappearance. After a 10-day trial and just 90 minutes of deliberation, the jury find Victoria guilty on all charges. She is sentenced to 21 years in prison where, the judge says, this extremely dangerous woman will only be known by a number. True to form, Victoria tells him where to go on her way out of the courtroom. Now you get shuffled off to a state prison where you'll be blended into the general population and be known only by a number. You see, in this place, in this country, there's a price to pay when you try to end someone's life. There's no excuse for what you did here except the exploitation of your own self-interest, and in doing so, you threw everything of value into the wind. So for that, I sentence you to the bottom. Count one, attempted murder, eight felony, 21 years in jail. Victoria Nasrova is incarcerated at the Bedford Hills Correctional Facility. She still continues to claim that she is innocent. Once her sentence is finished in the U.S., it is likely she will be deported to stand trial for the murder of Allah Alexenko. With the trial over, Nadia feels that justice has finally been served. She lost her mother in the most horrific way possible, but with Victoria serving a long sentence, she feels her mother can finally rest in peace. Meanwhile, Nadia and Olga have become lifelong friends. Olga is working hard to find closure and put the old ghosts to rest, and that includes learning how to trust others once again. She is a manipulator and a liar, she says. I thank God that she can't do what she's been doing to people anymore. Although, who knows what she's doing in jail. She's capable of anything.